Okay, we might make a start. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the the webinar Living with Disability of the Living with Disability Research Centre. Just want to start start by acknowledging the La Trobe University acknowledges that our campus is located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. We recognise their ongoing connection to the land and value their unique contribution to the university and wider Australian society. We're committed to providing opportunities for Indigenous Australians, both as individuals and communities, through teaching and learning, research and community partnerships across all of our campuses. The Trobe University pays our respects to Indigenous Elders, past, present and emerging, and will continue to incorporate Indigenous knowledge systems and protocols as part of our ongoing strategic and operational business. So this afternoon's uh, seminar um, follows the usual pattern. We have two speakers um, and the first speaker will speak for maybe half an hour and then we'll have some Q&A and we'll have a quick break and then we'll have our second speaker. So this afternoon's seminar focuses on uh, the impact of COVID-19 um, over the last couple of years um, on people with intellectual disabilities and their families. And we've got two uh, perspectives from um, two different places or a number of places. So Tao Ariton Bergman is speaking about a study that she completed in Israel with her colleague, colleague Kamit Spiegelman. Um, and she's going to speak first. And then our second speaker is Christine Lynham from University College Dublin, who completed a very extensive international study that included an Australian uh, branch to it and an Israeli branch. And she's going to talk about those uh, over, um, overall findings from that study. Um, and she's got up very early in the morning. So we're very grateful to Christine for being with us this afternoon or early this morning in your time. So I'm going to hand over first of all to Tao Ariton Bergman, who is a member of the Living with Disability Research Centre at La Trobe and a senior lecturer in social work. Um, so over to you, Tao. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, I would like to present today work that we've done um, in Israel with, together with my colleague, Dr. Kormich Friedelman from Haifa University. Um, and it's about family members' perspectives about the impact of um, COVID and the first lockdown about, um, about people living in supported accommodation um, in Israel. So just to... Um, if you haven't noticed, we had uh, some crisis in the world in the last two or three years. Um, the COVID uh, outbreak has changed everything um, and the reality that we live in for everybody. Um, the response to it was um, government around the world rapidly um, uh, started to use um, introduced public health measures, limiting community transition for COVID-19, and that happened to all of us. Um, people with um, intellectual disability and those living in supported accommodation are especially vulnerable, have been um, recognized as especially vulnerable to the adverse effect of the pandemic. They are both um, at higher risk of catching the virus, uh, developing uh, more um, severe disease, and um, because of their, um, uh, again, uh, a combination of their uh, characteristics and living arrangements, um, they're also um, at high risk of, uh, of having the observed effect of the um, psychological effect as well. Um, the public uh, health response for people with uh, intellectual disabilities in supported accommodations um, have resulted in changes in uh, daily routine, staff roles, and the involvement of families and other informal support networks in their lives. Um, Israel, so what has happened in Israel? The first um, case of COVID in Israel was at the end of uh, February, the 21st of February. Um, from February and March, the Israeli government and especially the Israeli Ministry of Health gradually introduced a series of public health um, instruments for the general populations. These includes restrictions in um, 
getting around, traveling, social distancing, shutdown um, of um, services, and people were advised to work from home and to, to wear a mask. I'm pretty sure that wherever you are on the globe, you, this sounds kind of familiar. Um, from April to May 2020, the Israeli government introduced um, periods off and on of quarantine and lockdowns and national wide um, lockdowns. Um, for people with disabilities, um, especially people uh, living in um, residential settings, um, the government have recognized their vulnerabilities and um, they introduced further restrictions. Um, whereas restrictions um, and guidelines were um, managed by the Ministry of Health for the general population, for people with intellectual disability, um, the Ministry of Labor, Social Affairs and Social Services came into play and, reduced, and produced more additional uh, restrictions. Um, so what has happened is services had to actually um, negotiate and rely on multiple source of guidance how to work and what are they can and cannot do and how to provide services. Um, so again, we could see the general guidelines, again, from the Ministry of Health, the, sp the specific regulation from the Mis Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, local health uh, units, and um, internal policies within the services themselves, the organizations themselves, and each group homes needed to find how to manage the situation. Um, what was clear that lockdown, so when the pandemic was kind of the outbreak came, um, pretty quickly um, services have, or the government has introduced a lockdown in services. Um, people living in different uh, arrangements uh, were prohibited from leaving their apartment. And I use this word prohibited because it was that. It was, it was communicated in the way that you, it's not about banned, you are not allowed to go out of your apartment. Um, all face-to-face uh, -face contact and direct contact were um, banned, um, which restricted families to visit. Um, and external um, service providers and care providers couldn't come into the uh, homes as well. Um, only permanent staff could meet the residents and they were allowed only um, wearing PEP. Um, community services, including day program, vocational rehabilitation services uh, were closed and they were closed from in one day noticed. So the, the changes in people routine was, were very, very sudden. Um, mainstream health services and social services were delivered uh, via telehealth or ceased to exist. Um, in early May 2020, um, most restrictions from um, the general population were eased. However, uh, the recommendation um, uh, or the guidelines for people in supported accommodation remained. So they still the lockdown continue even when the whole general population um, was already released. Um, this decision to keep the, the again the lockdown in those um, um, services um, triggered a huge policy debate and advocacy efforts um, with family caregivers. Um, we kept Kermit and I are um, members of many parents group and advocacy groups, and we keep kept reading in the social media and in the media a lot of um, heartbreaking stories about families' experience that you know they were uh, separate, separated from their uh, loved one, and they felt that um, they had no control and no understanding of what's going on inside the accommodation, um, and were very, very worried for um, the person um, um, well-being and health. Um, and they actually um, uh, were some legal action uh, going forward um, and protesting this those regulations. And at the end of the day, it was lifted. But again, 
most restrictions of are stay there for months and months. So in when we were uh, when Clomit and I looked at all those um, heartbreaking testimonies, we wanted to understand what's going on. Um, we um, initiated a mixed message uh, designed um, study to actually understand what's going on with families. How do they communicate um, during the lockdown? Um, so um, our study had two, two parts. The first one was um, a cross-sectional uh, survey that um, came into play, uh, went live within the time of the lockdown. So what we see here is um, a picture, a snapshot of what has happened within that time of the lockdown. Um, and after that, so we had 108 family carers, adult with um, intellectual disability and supported accommodation responding to that. Um, and after that, we, um, out of those 108 people, we asked people to um, volunteer and to talk to us and to have some more qualitative in-depth interviews, understanding their experiences. Um, and um, 19 of, of those family members have volunteered to, um, to, to share their experience. In the survey, what we uh, try to understand is um, how do people communicate? So models, frequency of engagement, face-to-face -face visit, phone calls, video calls, text, video messaging uh, before and during the pandemic. Um, how satisfies family or how um, how helpful family found those um, frequency and mode of engagement before and after? Um, what kind? What did they do in, in those engagements? So, what kind of support were they able to provide? And um, facilitators and barriers for engagement. So, what was missing for people to to actually engage in a way that was um, that they felt was helpful or meaningful? Um, so out of the 108 families, uh, 75 were parents, um, 21 siblings, four other family members. Um, most of them were legal guardians of the person. 67% um, uh, of, 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 of the people lived in group homes, um, 31 in supported community living, and two were living in institutionalized um, like facilities. Um, so in the survey, we found that although the bleak uh, picture that we got, carers adopted really quickly and they found new ways to communicate with their relatives. Um, when they weren't able to visit them face to face, they fought very hard and we'll talk about that to keep those visits, but when that fails, um, they increase the, the frequency of their engagement. They uh, uh, use new um, methods using video calls, using WhatsApp, things that have not been in their day-to-day um, -day, um, routine beforehand, they now have adopted. Um, so no surprisingly, we could see a decrease in the frequency of face-to-face -face contact, um, no significant changes in the family contacts via phone, but the big, big, the big story was here, the increased um, frequency of use of remote technologies. Um, when we were speaking, 64% um, of the parents or the carers were using that kind of communication um, to stay in touch with their, um, the person in the residential setting. And they, um, most of them, actually all of them said that this is the, the video calls were the main, um, the, main, the, way, the main way that they could communicate. Um, surprisingly, 70, almost 80% of them said that it was um, the best way to communicate. It was very helpful. Um, we wanted to understand what kind of support um, and not just how often they um, um, communicate, but what did they do in those conversations? So we could see a, a decrease in the social support um, that people could provide. Um, 
main, uh, they maintain, most of them maintain or even increase the emotional support they provided during the pandemic. 13% um, um, said that they also had to increase the, uh, again, the financial support that they can provide. 17% um, uh, provided more assistance in decision making, which makes sense, you know, um, which was what was happening. And again, the big story is here, 38% of participants reported an increase in um, advocacy. Uh, and they were more involved in advocacy and advocated for people with um, pe their relatives, human rights or bill, um, in um, in the light of the restrictions. Um, so we asked them, what do you want? What, what, what kind of, uh, what do you need in order to stay in touch uh, with um, the person? So 60% said that they wanted more face-to-face -face visit. They understood that uh, the restriction were there to protect um, their relatives, but they said that it's, it's, it just doesn't fit. The people that they need to see the people in their life. Um, and that was um, across the board. Um, other 20, almost 30% wanted more phone calls and video calls. And these were um, the people that were dependent on staff to facilitate those calls. Some families, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we um, look at the qualitative, um, were able to provide their relatives with devices like an iPhone or a smartphone or a laptop or whatever, so they can actually initiate and talk to them whenever they want. However, and they can call back. However, um, there were other people that weren't able to use those um, and they needed the support um, of the uh, staff to use those devices or they relied on um, staff in order to um, use their own phones in, in order to initiate those calls. Um, more than half uh, wanted to receive more information, um, updates, and actual support from staff uh, during the pandemic. They wanted um, them to help their residents um, communicate with them. They wanted um, uh, people, uh, staff, to um, give them update and to give them more understanding of what's going on the day-to-day uh, life of the person. And unfortunately, only 9% um, felt that this kind of support was available to them. So that presents an interesting picture. It's, it's, to me, it's, it presents that people adapt. People try different things. People uh, um, were more involved. People wanted to stay in touch with people, with, with their relatives to provide them with the support. They were frustrated when they couldn't and they tried different ways and they were looking for um, the support of services to help them to stay in touch and to stay in, involved in the life of, of the person. Um, so we were kind of encouraged reading that. And then um, we started, uh, we wanted to get an in-depth understanding of, of the whole experience of the families and how did they feel the impact of, of the pandemic and mostly the lockdown um, had what impact that they had on, on their life. And that's why we um, spoke um, with them. We had uh, in, uh, qualitative interviews um, and what we wanted to look at the impact of the pandemic in three on three micro on three uh, systems: the micro system, the impact on the on the person, the family, and the relationships; the massa systems, which is the community of the service. So experiencing, uh, uh, engaging with the organization, with the service um, service providers and other families which are uh, part of the community of, fam of family. And uh, the macro level, their understanding and their perceptions or perspective about the general service uh, system, what has happened, the policy and the society as a whole. So um, impact of, on the lockdown on the health and well-being of people with intellectual disabilities. So, Again, nothing um, 
um, new here. We've seen it in many researchers, many research, other research as well. But what we could see that carers reported um, raised concern about the physical health and the psychological um, health of their um, of the person. Um, they attributed it to um, changes in the person routines, changes in staff roles, availability and support, and um, um, again, lack of social engagement. Um, and they felt that many of uh, many felt that the person felt uh, distressed, lonely, and burdensome and, and bored. Um, some um, carers uh, raised concern about the restriction, uh, the reduction in healthy lifestyle. And again, this comes into the mother's level as well. They felt out of the loop. They felt out of control. They felt that the services have withdrawn um, a lot of, of their engagement and they didn't know what's going on. The services weren't there to support the person as they thought that they should and the routine has changed. Um, and then they felt that that, uh, that as well has impacted the person's physical health. Um, Chris, could you please read the quote? So uh, a sister talked about what had happened uh, to um, her sibling. She said, I, I don't know what they're eating now. She's gained a lot of weight, obviously just eating junk. Before there were salads and fruits, you know, healthy food. But when quarantine started, I think she lost it. She eats only sweets, sandwiches, pretzels. She doesn't move or sleep because of all this sugar. So maybe it's because nobody tells her to go to sleep. I just don't know. Anyway, she's gained a lot of weight and it's not good for her. Other family carers uh, reported the person's physical health as worsened and um, pre-existing pre, uh, um, conditions have worsened. And they were very concerned about how the situation were handled with the um, limited access to health care. So I was very, very stressed because one of the sisters said, one, I was very, very stressed because uh, for nine years, um, he had once, not, not scissor, but especially, uh, uh, but you from January, it? February, he had, he had already four seizures. They had no, they had to change his medication. Um, another aspect is they, uh, Kara felt that changes in uh, the person, they changes in um, the routine has resulted and the pandemic itself. The person, they um, the notice uh, changes in the person's mood and uh, mental health. Um, they've seen uh, a lot of distress. Um, Chris, could you read the quotes, please? Yep. So um, um, a mother says, we, we, can, we can understand that these guys faced a harder time when their families have suddenly gone. They could not go to work, other activities just stopped and they had to stay locked in their room all day. My son started experiencing nervous outbursts in this pressure cooker situation. And then there's a, another quote from another mother. She says, I saw that Jonathan was depressed, sad and apathetic. Sometimes he also cried and asked us to meet him. Um, his parents. He said, I also know about his roommate that he refused to get out of bed all day. And then a sister said, at the beginning of our conversations were happy. At the beginning, our conversations were happier, but later I became worried because I've noticed that he was less happy. He looked depressed and less communicative. I was worried that the social distancing and isolation for such a long time made a negative impact on him. And of course, some um, uh, felt that the daily routine have increased the challenging behavior, especially when people didn't understand um, the situation, didn't understand why um, um, their routine has changed. Due to, due to the lockdown, I can see the regression. He, he, um, he's agitated uh, and anxious. He can, um, he can suddenly curse. Again, they were very, very concerned about, again, um, how this situation um, has been handled and about, um, again, the use of, of drugs and to use, uh, restrictive measures um, to help control those um, challenging behaviors. 
On the other hand, some carers described that situation uh, of, by lockdown had a positive effect on the person's well-being. So um, it's, go ahead. Sorry. The sister says, it seemed that, that my sister understood the situation. She keeps saying it is prohibited to go out or get in because there is COVID, but it seems that she didn't care about it. I get the impression that she experiences this period as a summer holiday camp. She wakes up whenever she wants. She spends all day at home with her friends, her boyfriend, and everything is relaxed. Um, so that was for people, for um, the person themselves. We also looked at the impact of the lockdown on the carers and some carers struggling to adapt to the um, um, changing circumstances themselves. They describe being uh, worried about their own um, mental health, feeling overwhelmed, um, and they felt that they are being torn by competing demands, um, struggling to manage their own daily routines, uh, the mental health, while meeting the support needs of the person. Um, it was very, very clear that the disruption of services led to sudden unanticipated change uh, in their relationship. In some case, ca cases, um, parents uh, describe feeling helpless, losing control over the situation. And they, they, that, of course, impacted their, their uh, physical and mental health. And there are two quotes here. We've got a, we got a message from the group home that from this minute, the residents are in fact quarantined. I mean, all the recreational activities have been canceled. The residents could not go home, even, even to us, our pa parents. They could not, we could not visit our children in the hostel. It felt like a five kilo hammer fell on the head. It was very, very, very hard for me. I began to take tranquilizers because I could not function. That was from a mother. And another mother said, this situation is very much exhausting. The statistics also show that mothers of children with special needs tend to get cancer and high blood pressure more than others. I myself have had a, had a lot of tumours. I know that the recent lockdown cost me a mental health price. Um, other people, especially, um, again, other, um, especially siblings, described um, um, the strain and the, the mixed emotions about their role and responsibility. They got confused um, um, when they're supporting their, their siblings. So Leah, who was a sister said, if I want to be 100% honest with you, I have mixed emotions about the whole thing. On one hand, I wanted to run and be with him. But on the other hand, I felt relief that others take care of him. I was emotionally distressed since I didn't know what was going on with him. But at the same time, I felt guilty. I was thinking about my parents who asked me to take care of him. I'm now responsible for him and I felt I didn't fulfill my responsibility. I feel that I worry a lot, but they, the staff, didn't let me get inside and see him. So I cannot help him. They're actually responsible for him. So I think it's, it, this quote, I love this quote because it shows how confused and overwhelmed the sister was. And you know, the whole um, interview was, you could hear her speaking really, really fast and you could hear um, how conflicted she is about who should take care of them and what is their role right now when, when you know, the restrictions say that they can't be what she felt, they can't be involved. Um, so families, um, another aspect of, of the, uh, the microsystem is, is about um, the relationship between the person and the, and the family. And um, some people, um, family, they, they um, put a lot of great effort to stay in touch and to provide support during um, the corona, they, again, substituting in-person visit to remote communication. But that means that um, communication um, was actually dependent on the person's capacity to use uh, different technologies, the availabilities of, of devices, um, or if the family were able to um, afford them. Um, in some services, um, there was some account of, um, there were one computer on Zoom, and uh, one of the residents used it all the time and nobody else had access to it. 
things like that meant that people weren't be weren't able to to stay in touch and the most important thing is the availability of staff members support um, and willingness to provide support chris could you read yep. please Thank so you. one of the mothers said he, he saw us on a video call and I kept telling him that we didn't we'd not abandoned him and that we were still waiting and the government would let us come and meet him. And a brother said we told him that we love him and we tried to support him in accordance to his abilities. We tried to make him understand that we had not abandoned him. But a lot of them felt that they the resident didn't understand why they suddenly disappeared from their life. Um I don't, on the other hand, other felt that the, um, that the lockdown has actually brought them together um, using um, uh, different technologies, uh, enable new opportunities to engage, um, to um, people were able to suddenly be part of family dinners, um, people were able to play game together, um, watch movies together, things like that. So if the person had the capacity and the support and the device, there was a lot of opportunities for new, um, new, new opportunities for engagement there and for inclusion there. Um, and as one mother said, usually he can't stand noises, and that's the reason why celebrating Passover evening with all the family is hard for him. But this year it was different. He was home for a couple of weeks before. He loved to be with all of us and even to read the Passover. I can't Agada. say that. Agada. And ask questions. But to tell you the truth, it was the best Passover evening I've ever had with my son. And another brother said? I initiated more online meetings with him. We talked on Skype every day, while in the past, before the pandemic, we rarely talked. Um, there were beautiful accounts of, again, people speaking to their niece and nephews and things that weren't there before and now we're um, available because they use the video calls and people were home and more vacant to talk to them. Um, I would like to speak a little bit about the mother system. So how people uh, felt the service system and their community in the service system has responded and what are, were the impact on the lockdown? So the majority of carers, and again, we need to understand that we spoke to carers in the midst of the first lockdown. So um, it was in the crisis mode. They were very, very, there were a lot of have a, a very negative um, perception and criticism about the way that managers and, and frontline staff um, has um, um, behaved and what they allowed. Um, some carers have realized that staff uh, followed the instructions or the policy, but they felt that they were quite rigid and that each um, um, residential setting inter uh, interpreted the, the national policy in a different ways. Um, carers often um, report that they had to fight the system to maintain a basic communication and information about the person's situation. Again, that um, was very, very um, <laughs> obvious and it was linked to their um, feeling powerless and, and less in control. Um, in the absence of clear policy and guidance, um, carers relied on personal relationship with staff. We heard a beautiful, um, that, you know, they sent them flower during the, uh, during the pandemic and things like that, just to keep them on the good side. Um, or felt that they had to advocate very strongly for the person's right. And if you remember when we spoke about the, um, um, survey we could see that a lot a lot more carers were involved in advocacy um chris thank you one mother said uh, they the staff didn't inform us that he stopped eating we saw it when we were when we when we were allowed to meet there were no updates to the parents we didn't know what they were doing with them all day the residents were climbing the walls bored and frustrated and there's another one do you want me to read that yes please Okay, no updates me or my father. No one updates me or my father. This is from a sister. Only when we ask for an update, we get it. It also depends on the personality of the staff member. Now there is a new housekeeper that she is very open and willing to receive calls to her private phone. On last Thursday, I asked them, the staff, to find a time for me to talk with my brother. 
this is only a five minute talk because he's incapable to make longer calls. They said, no, you've already used your weekly Zoom. So I asked again, maybe via WhatsApp. And they said, no, this is too much of a burden for the team. So one week they refused and the following week, the housekeeper felt sorry for me and made a surprise call. Uh, yeah, well, and this is really about the advocacy that people were involved in. Um, so this is a count from a mother that is, she's a, a, a very strong advocate, um, but it's really interesting to see how she felt that she was in a conflict um, um, with, the, with the service. Chris, could you read, um, Sarah? Yeah. Thank you. This mother says, I warned, I warned the staff, there's no way they should move James to another apartment. It took exactly two weeks until I got a message that they're planning to close his apartment and move him to another one. My advantage over the other parents is that I know the system from inside and I know how it operates. So I'm always one step ahead. I also have spies there and they told me that there is a plan to close the apartment. I told the staff, listen, James is not moving to any other apartment. Not only he cannot come back home for two weeks, and now you're going to move him to a new room, new environment that he doesn't know for an unlimited time over my dead body. I also told them we're going to organize a protest against this decision. At the end, I got a message that James is staying in his apartment. So I understood that there was no other way than threatening if I want to get something for my son. And Again, um, this one from a very active activist, but we heard um, that kind of testimonies from many families that weren't as involved beforehand. Um, let's see. Um, so another um, thing is that uh, the carers felt that the, the services weren't um, accommodating. They weren't really, um, they, they locked, but they didn't introduce new measures in order to keep people um, engaged. Um, they felt that they um, were very technical and they didn't really look at the person's well-being. Um, they didn't take it at heart. Um, parents that kept the, that decided to take their um, kids home, for instance, of their um, the person home, felt that um, nobody called, nobody really wanted to know what's going on. Um, People were talking about um, people talking. Were talking about um, um, the people were left alone, and nobody really showed interest in their um, well-being as well. Um, another aspect of it, and I'm just looking at my time. And another aspect of it is um, the relationship formed within the community. Um, in the services. So families, some families kept in touch and actually supported each other um, and sharing information um, and formed uh, some kind of a community. Um, they, uh, you, they opened WhatsApp um, um, uh, groups for the families. Um, many felt that the services weren't very happy about that, but again, they found that very, very supportive. Um, and some um, families help each other, carers help each other um, to realize the right of the person. Um, for instance, um, there were um, many quotes um, as Chris. Mary? I'm very, this is from a mother. I'm very involved in my role as head of a disability group in a major political party. I get all the COVID instructions directly from the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Social Welfare. So I disseminate the instructions to the families. I also help other parents in special cases, such as children who've not met their parents for a long period of time. Mm. And again, it's really important to say that that's very supportive, but other ones um, felt that there always, um, there wasn't always, um, it wasn't always very supportive. There was some conflict that people were um, um, trying to meet the kid, the the people in the in and and break the lockdown, and then other families felt that um, they're putting their risk, the people in risk, and there were a lot of conflict there. Um, 
And I just want to end by saying, look, having a look at the, the national policy, uh, carers felt um, that, um, that the restriction didn't make sense and that um, they didn't take into account um, uh, the different um, um, needs, support needs and characteristics of people. They didn't take into account that people's um, that people are in um, in different situations and have different needs, um, and they felt that the the system was very very rigid. Um, they felt outside of any decision made that they felt that they were excluded, and that they felt that people um, with disability were treated as a whole. Um, as um, Sarah, the mother, um, spoke about. Chris? She says, when a person has special needs, he's automatically categorized as part of an at-risk population, and anyone in the system can decide for him and for his family and prevent his basic freedom to meet the people he loves and cares for. Like everyone, like everything is allowed under the auspice of COVID, people with disabilities are not necessarily an at-risk population, and policymakers have to keep in mind the rights of our children with special needs. And I think that, again, one of the things that um, um, was very, very strongly that they wanted more um, transparency in the way the decisions were made. They want to be involved in those decisions and they wanted to have their voice heard. And this is what part of the things that we try to do in, um, in this, um, in this um, research. And I can see that I'm out of time, so I'll skip on that and um, I'll say thank you very much. And, um, and Kilmeet and my uh, emails are here for any questions, aside from the question that we want to address now. And I think that um, Kilmeet is in the lobby, so if somebody can let her in, that will be good. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Tao. That's a very powerful presentation, some amazing um, things. Hey, welcome back to the second half of the seminar. Um, and it's a great pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Christine Lynham from University College Dublin, where it's incredibly early in the morning. Um, Christine led a study which included 12 countries and uh, surveyed carers of people with intellectual disabilities in those countries and included trying to herd together, you can imagine, researchers from all of those countries, which was a, an amazing exercise that she conducted with great patience and skill. Um, and so she's going to present the, the overall findings from that study, which, I, which are now um, published, and there will be other papers coming out of this study. So over to you, Christine. Right. Thanks so much, Chris. Um... So yeah, my name is Christine Linehan and um, it's it's 6 a.m. here in Dublin. But uh, first of all, acknowledgement, many thanks to Chris for the invitation. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to present um, and, and to be a part of your, your events at La Trobe. So thank you for that. I also want to thank our funder, which is the Health Research Board. They're one of the larger uh, funding bodies here in Ireland. Our 27 co-investigators uh, on this project and, and obviously then participants who took part. Uh, I, I thought I'd look at the literature a little bit to, to put us in the space of, of this study. Um, so if you go right back to the beginning of the pandemic, there's some interesting papers on impact. Um, the one study here, Mills et al. in the US, they describe a, a provider of services for over 11,000 individuals with intellectual disabilities. And within the first 100 days of the pandemic, 66 people were diagnosed, 15 were hospitalized and three people died. And I think you, you get the sense of uh, urgency and emergency from another study by a colleague of mine, Fina Bueno and, and his colleagues in Sicily. Um, they reported that within 20 days of what they described as K0 in OASI, which is a, a clinical hospital in Sicily, within 20 days, 109 patients, uh, as, as they termed, uh, were diagnosed with COVID, six of whom later died. So that, that is quite a congregated setting. I visited it there, but it it shows how instant uh, the, the impact of COVID uh, in, in terms of morbidity and mortality was felt. Um, there are large studies, uh, very comprehensive study by Gleason and colleagues in the US, 
they had records, health records on over 65 million people with about 130,000 uh, of those individuals having uh, intellectual disability. And you can see there the, the, the rates in terms of diagnosis, hospitalization, mortality, that they're very much elevated for people with intellectual disabilities, diagnosis 3% versus 1%. Hospitalization, if you are diagnosed at 63% for people with ID, 29% without intensive care stays, 14.5% versus 6%, and regrettably mortality at over twice the rate. Uh, so again, early studies, but really indicating this very strong impact uh, of COVID on, on people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, this is uh, again from the same study. It looks at uh, odds ratios of predictors uh, of COVID. And you can see right up the top there that the top predictor was intellectual disability. Um, and again, if you look at the, the risk factors for mortality, and what you see is apart from the disparity in age, whether you're you know 60 and over versus the younger age cohort, the next risk factor for mortality is actually intellectual disability, again, just showing this huge impact that we have for this population. Um, obviously, the, the issue around where people live is central here. This is a very large study by Landis et al, um, looking at population-based data sets in California, where you can directly compare people with uh, intellectual disability and those who don't. And you can see at the top there, the mortality rate where I circled it, for Californians who aren't receiving uh, IDD services, the mortality rate per 100,000 is about 41. You go down to the bottom one in skilled nursing facilities, the second bottom one, it's 5,626. So you have a significantly elevated uh, mortality risk uh, for, for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, and, and there was commentary early on on you know, why this is happening. Um, Obviously, the many people with intellectual and developmental disabilities will have uh, physical and mental health conditions that that may uh, put them at, at more risk of COVID. Certainly, cramped living conditions, and we saw that with elderly populations. Also, living with vulnerable and elderly family members may be a cause of you contracting it. Certainly, the higher levels of personal care and staff contact challenges to routine and challenges in accessing uh, information and self-advocacy, as we've heard from Tal. So moving then to the study that we did and, and the rationale behind it, I suppose something that, that probably was, was high on everybody's agenda at the time um, was the, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. And that requirement that states that, that have signed and ratified the convention uh, that we have an obligation to organize, strengthen, and extend support services. And when you think of that within the context of COVID, how well did we meet that, that requirement to organize, strengthen, and extend support services? And we put it in the context within, I know there was a comment around this earlier, I was very interested in the chat there, um, within the context of AAIDD, that's the American Association for Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, and they have what they refer to as a support needs model. And the support needs model, it, it says that support need is a psychological construct, that we all have support needs, but different people have, have different uh, needs here. And they argue that people with ID are people who require provision of ongoing and extraordinary patterns of support. And they say if those supports were removed, people with ID would not be able to function as successfully in typical activities and settings. So I think COVID is probably our acid test really, isn't it, of what happened when those supports were removed. Uh, and, and, and we have quite some evidence now as to what actually happened. Uh, and that is if the supports were removed and, and one would wonder if it happened again, would the supports be removed in the same way? So I suppose the rationale for our study was that COVID caused a disruption to that ongoing extraordinary pattern of support and we were interested in that. We wanted to document that disruption uh, to people with ID and to their caregivers um, globally. So who were we that, that took part? Um, and, and as Chris alluded to there, we, we got a, 
a band of researchers around us and, and it came through from IASID. So I think many of you will be familiar with the International Association for the Scientific Study of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, which is not easy to say at 6 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> but I guess most of you are quite familiar with that. And in IASID, uh, it's an association for, for people you know, uh, interested in this field. There are a number of special interest research groups and the group that Chris and I would be active in is comparative policy and practice. So what does that mean? It is exactly what it says. We're interested in comparing policy and practice in, um, in different jurisdictions. So we, we got a band of people together, but we're always interested to hear from people. And as I say, we are global and we're going places. So if anybody's interested, you can email me and, and we'd be very happy to, to increase our, our membership of this group. Um, these are all the people who uh, took part as, as researchers and co-investigators in the study. And of some familiar names there, you see Chris and you also see Cal, so they, they need no introduction. We have various other people here that you may be familiar with some of the names there. But just if you see in capital letters that the countries, you can see that we're widely represented on, on this project, uh, some more successful than others. I'll, I'll talk about that on. Uh, and also um, a, an Irish colleague of mine who has now uh, moved to Australia, and that's uh, Associate Professor Marianne O'Donovan. So she's also representing uh, Australia there. But again, you can see the other countries, Norway, Sweden, Chechnya, the United States, Italy, et cetera. So good, good representation, India as well. What happened? So in at the early stages of the pandemic in May 2020, the Irish government uh, allocated funding for COVID research to three of the largest funding bodies uh, in the country. And they had what were called rapid responses. And out of 350 applications, 26 were funded in the first round and we were successful in our funding. So I think that spoke very well to the possibilities for uh, intellectual disability research, which often I would consider the Cinderella of, of the research uh, funds. Um, but, you know, we were competing against, well, vaccines weren't around at the time, but we were competing against that type of research. So it was very positive to, to see that we were, we were allocated our funding. A significant element of all of these grants that were issued was the data management and open publishing. So in fact, our data is um, available if anybody is interested to um, do secondary data analysis. If it's helpful to talk to me, I'd be very happy to talk to you. You see down the bottom of the, the slide there in very, very small font is the DOI. So if you click on that, you do actually get to the data, the metadata, the descriptions and everything, and you'd be most welcome uh, to, to, to have a look at it. Um, if, if that's of interest to you, it's in the open science framework. So with this whole move to, to open science and, and transparency, we were uh, invited to publish a study protocol. Um, and, and you can see our, our co-authors there setting out what, what we hoped to do. Um, so th these were our research questions. Um, first of all, um, what are the experiences of caregivers, family and staff and the people they support during the pandemic? And then do these differ by living arrangement and by jurisdiction across the, the countries that we uh, had involved in the study. So to do this, there really was only way, one way to do it, and that was to uh, do an online survey. Um, and to do that in a number of different international countries, we were gonna have to translate our survey. So we developed um, a bespoke survey uh, in teasing out experiences of caregivers and, and the people they support. And we back translated that into 15 languages and they're there on, on the right. Um, our survey was hosted on a survey here in Ireland. By the time we got ethics, by the time we piloted, et cetera, we launched it in September 2020. And participants were able to access it on any device. So whether you have your iPad or your phone or whatever, there is clearly a bias in recruitment here because only those people who have access to a device that, you know, uh, would be able to take part in the study. Um, so we realize that the, there is um, a, a group of people that are not represented in our findings, people who wouldn't have access to these devices. But it, that was really only the, the only way uh, methodology we could think at the time. 
this is what our survey was lo looking at. Obviously, we had a demographic section, as you'd expect. We then looked at uh, management practices. So we had a number of uh, managers taking part uh, who, who run disability services. We had a section for people who, if you were a um, direct support worker, about the practices in your workplace uh, throughout the pandemic, at, at that point in the pandemic, should I say. We had a section for family caregivers. We looked at information and training. We then looked at what I described as the experiences of COVID. So whether you were tested, whether you were diagnosed, if you had symptoms, if you were hospitalized, et cetera. Um, we had a, a section on social distancing. And the final section was where we, they were all bespoke questions. This was standardized, uh, a standardized measure, the DAS, um, the depression, anxiety and stress uh, scale. And we, we asked caregivers to complete that. So that's some kind of good psychometric data, uh, standardized measure that we had there. Um, I do have to put a caveat here. It is a distinct limitation that we did not seek the participation of individuals with disabilities. We spoke to caregivers. There really was no possibility at that time to recruit people with intellectual disability. And that was largely because of the fact that we couldn't access the disability services themselves. They were so overrun with changing their, their practices that unfortunately they, they were just not going to get involved in, in a piece of research. It just was not a priority. What we did do to try and address this issue was we asked uh, Inclusion International, some of you may know, if we could present our findings, our preliminary findings to their uh, advocates and that they would give us a steer on, on our findings. And they, they did that again across Zoom. Uh, so everything was, was via Zoom, but that, that was very informative. We also agreed that many of the partners would be involved in future research that probably would lead on from, from findings here, um, and that that would include the direct voice of people with uh, intellectual disability. And two such projects have uh, been conducted here in Ireland, and I'll give you some uh, preliminary findings. One of those is being reviewed for publication, and the other is in the process of being written up, but with permission, I can uh, give you a little bit of the qualitative findings from those. So this is um, just a, an illustration of the countries that took part. We actually had 18 countries that took part, but we actually only could use data from 12. And that was because the, the countries in blue, the numbers were just too small to justify including them in the analysis. It's there if, if you wish to draw down the, the anonymized data, it's there. Um, but the, the data I'm presenting today is just from the 12 countries in red. Um, this is our, our flow chart of, we, we started off with 5,422 responses, which we were very pleased with. But of course, you lose people the whole way along from when they consent to really very little demographics. Then, of course, we, we excluded those six countries where the data was, was really very diminished. At the end of the day, we ended up with 3,754 uh, participants, all of whom are either people who work in services, either as managers, our direct support staff, or family caregivers. So I, I think it was a, a, a good response rate. We were pleased with that. This just gives you again that breakdown, uh, 3,754 participants, large proportion of those are family members, almost 2,000, 1,300 direct support professionals, and that was defined as working directly, uh, supporting people on a day-to-day -day basis, and then 503 management. So I'm only giving a flavor today of some of the findings, but we can drill down on these, uh, as Chris said, uh, and on. This gives you an idea of the breakdown by country, and what you can instantly see with the countries that I circled is that there is a, a huge bias towards maybe some of the more higher income countries. So particularly Sweden there is almost a quarter of the entire sample. So I think that our findings really have to be interpreted as high income uh, countries. Let's have a look at some of the findings. Well, unsurprisingly, I suppose if we just looked at the restrictions, you know, very high percentages there of restrictions around family and friends, closures or severe re reductions in services, uh, educational, that kind of thing. So at the time that this study was happening, I suppose you think September, we're now into September was when we, we opened up uh, our survey. So people were in that space of 
you know, either lockdown or very, very severe uh, restrictions in, in many of the countries. Um, so some of the findings that we had, what are the, the experiences of individuals who have intellectual and developmental disabilities? So this is family members and staff reporting back. So we have uh, up at the top left, I suppose, I'm going to go, well, on my screen it is, and I'm going to go through it that way. So we had uh, over one in five of the caregivers said that they observed the person that they supported having what they, they thought might have been COVID symptoms. And then if you go down, over 80% of those were actually quarantined. So high rates now of people being quarantined where there's a suspicion uh, in about one in five that you actually have COVID symptoms. Almost a third of people there in the middle uh, were tested for COVID. And of those who were tested, um, about 24, 25% were actually diagnosed with COVID. So fairly high rates from testing to diagnosis. And then the last one we have is 27% of people who were diagnosed were hospitalized. That compares with that 27% of people who you're diagnosed and then you're hospitalized with COVID. When we asked the caregivers themselves, that figure was 2.5%. So there really is quite a, quite a high uh, rate there from diagnosis to hospitalized and then when you look at we had almost 25 percent one in four of people who were tested were diagnosed again for the carers themselves that was a lower figure at 13.4 percent we then asked carers what did what did you observe now these were closed items they weren't generated but what did you observe uh, in uh, the the um in the person that you supported uh during the the COVID and what we saw was more changes in mood so 64 percent of our respondents said there was a change in mood and we had defined that as uh, depression or anxiety I think that picks up what Tal said earlier uh half of our respondents said they saw more repetitive or stereotype behavior almost half said they observed more aggressive behaviors uh 38 percent 39 percent more self-harm and 29% more use of psychotropic medication. So I think we are definitely picking up here on some of these changes uh, that, that people are observing. We also asked about incidents of potential exploitation or abuse. You think a lot of these folks now are quite isolated. I think we saw that very well in Tal's presentation. So there is an issue about potential exploitation and abuse during this period. So we asked the caregivers, and you can see it's divided down by family members, our direct support staff, and, and then the totals, but I'll, I'll pick out some figures for you. So money or possessions being taken, you could 3% of, of our respondents said they observed that during the pandemic incidents of money or possessions taken. And if yes, did you know who to tell that to? Did you know who to bring that information to? So very high percentages of staff certainly knew who to bring that to. But if you look at, did you report all of those incidents, the figure is considerably lower. So there seems to be a gap here between this is what I observed and actually I report, or uh, that I know who to tell this to, but who I actually reported to. 2.6% of our respondents said they observed incidents of physical or sexual abuse. 92% um, said, I know who to bring that to, but it's really only 79% who brought all of those incidents to that person. And again, we can see the same pattern again, uh, looking at neglect. So there seemed to be some kind of an issue here around what you observed, did you know who to go to, but did you actually bring all cases to, uh, to, to uh, whoever it is that you were reporting to? So outcomes for the individuals with ID then, uh, we asked about people with particular support needs. And what we saw that for people who had pre-existing behaviors that challenge, people who engaged in those challenging behaviors, our respondents, direct support staff and families had a 60, observed 63%, 63% uh, of them observed an increase in behaviors that challenge. So that's a fairly high figure. 17% observed an increase in seizures. And again, that was noted by Tal in her presentation. What I think is interesting is that 9% of our respondents observed a decline in behaviors that challenge and 3% observed a decline in seizures. And that has been noted before, and that may reflect 
the kind of calming influence of lockdown and not having to get up and go to services etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's it, 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 the increase is definitely there but it's interesting to to consider the decline in in these um these behaviors as well looking then at direct staff so people engaging day to day with um with uh, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and what we see here is staff shifts were reorganized so over half of the people of our direct support staff said there was a reorganization of staff shifts um about 27 percent said we had new direct support staff and what's of concern there is about half of those cases it was casual new staff so these may be people who would not be trained to the same level uh, as existing staff. Holiday leave, unsurprisingly, was reduced for uh, a lot of people. Um, half of our respondents said they were asked to take on additional tasks, but actually only half of them were paid to do that. So there is an issue there for, uh, for direct support staff. Then looking at the DAS, so remember this was depression, anxiety and stress. It's, it's a standardized scale that's used. And what we found is for direct support staff, uh, almost a third of people were within the moderate to severe range of depression. So not normal, not mild, but that moderate to severe range. When you looked at anxiety, 17% in that moderate to severe range, a very, very high percentage over half were in the moderate to severe range of stress. And we looked at what were the predictors, statistically, what were the predictors of depression, anxiety, and stress. And we controlled for the, um, you can get a measure from Oxford University of the level of restriction in countries. So controlling for different levels of restrictions. What we found is that the biggest predictor of whether you were in that moderate or severe uh, category across any of the depression, anxiety or stress was reorganization of staff shifts, then increases in new staff and dissatisfaction with the timing of PPE. We also asked about um, the volume of PPE. That wasn't an issue, but the timing most certainly was. What about family caregivers? Um, 63% of families said they avoided attending healthcare facilities due to the pandemic. So that, that's a considerable issue around their own health. Um, almost one in five said they stopped working because they needed to support a family member. Um, over a third said they reduced the hours of work uh, that they went to because they had to support a family member. And over half said they spent more money on their family member than they would typically do. So there's a lot of issues here around employment and around finance for family members, as well as uh, other psychological issues that we look at. And, and here they are. Uh, and, and again, this is the DAS. So if you look at the figures here, they, they are higher than that reported for direct support staff. We have almost half of the families are scoring within that mild to severe range of depression. Uh, one and four within mo uh, moderate to severe range of anxiety and almost seven in 10 are reporting moderate to severe range, uh, uh, severe range of stress. Again, we try to look at what are the statistically the predictors of depression, anxiety and stress in family. And the biggest predictor was observing a mood change in the person I support with an IDD. So I'm a, a family member and I am most depressed, anxious or stressed because I'm observing a change in and a mood change in the person that I support. Um, the fact that the person was living in the family home was also a significant predictor, restrictions to family and friends and dissatisfaction with the level of support by the service provider. We did say we would look at um, experiences across different jurisdictions, but actually it was too skewed for analysis. So we decided that we would not do that, that it wouldn't be valid to do that. So regrettably, that is the case. However, we were able to look at differences in living arrangements. And uh, it was interesting, the discussion earlier around what is a group home and what is uh, institutional provision in, in different um, jurisdictions. So we basically went with four. We went with institutional setting or group homes where the, the the dwelling is owned by a service provider and is fully staffed by a service provider and on the other hand then you had people living in the family home 
and you had people living in their own home, either as a tenant or, or as a homeowner. So we kind of classified um, the person to being supported within those two different uh, models of it, it crude measure, but models of living, living arrangements. So when you look at those, I mean, suppose you have to bear in mind that it, there's a crossover here because if you're looking at people supported in the family home, it's probably a family member who's reporting back on that. But we looked at that caregiver well-being. So whether you um, whether you were supporting somebody in a family home or whether you were supporting somebody in in a more a group home, a residential campus setting, and uh, across the board, if you were supporting somebody in a family home you are more likely to be stressed, you are more likely to de be depressed, or you are more likely to be anxious than if you were supporting somebody in residential or uh, campus settings or group home settings. Um, your experiences of, of actually COVID itself, if you supported somebody in a family home, you were less likely to be tested for COVID, you were less likely to report COVID. But the interesting thing was that there were similar rates of diagnosis. So it may be that people who are supporting somebody in, in a service setting, uh, which is most likely really staff, are more likely to have routine testing. That, that may be what's happening there. What about uh, the outcome for people with particular support needs, depending on where they're living? And actually, we didn't see any difference there. So whether you live in the family home or whether you live more in, in a service setting, uh, the odds of challenging behavior of seizures or of sleep problems, et cetera, the, we really didn't find that much difference. So we found differences across the caregivers, but not in terms of uh, individuals with particular needs. Um, the outcome for people who are supported in terms of their experiences of, of COVID were different. If you are supported in a family home, you were less likely to be tested, less likely to be observed experiencing symptoms and less likely to be diagnosed. Um, so this may be around awareness and access to testing and diagnosis. Um, we, there was a little mention of this earlier around uh, restraint and we, we did ask some questions as around practices of restraint. So physical restraint was manual methods or physical uh, or mechanical devices. Um, where the, the individual cannot easily remove th those restrictions. So we uh, we had these definitions uh, within the survey so that people knew what they were responding to. And you were far less likely uh, to, to observe those um, it, within a, a family home setting. And again, you were uh, the environmental restraint um, of leaving, denying the person their normal means of independent mobility, et cetera. Um, you were far less likely to, to have those restrictions if, if the person was supported within the family home than within services. So just to take some, some um, issues for consideration there, um, I suppose it, one of the things that struck us was the considerable focus on older people in congregated settings during COVID. It, it wasn't matched with the same, in many of our jurisdictions, with the same level of concern around people with intellectual disability, that seemed to happen much later. And now in hindsight, looking back, I think people remember older people in elder care services, but ID just didn't seem to get the same level of attention. Um, another issue for consideration is, um, you know, th those observed behaviours clearly of distress that, that were observed by high proportions uh, of our caregivers and, and the stress for them in observing and not, not being able to do anything. Um, certainly a significant impact on employment and finances for family members. Um, the, the, the issue of new casual staff and the fact that they may be moving to different and multiple settings um, and testing in diagnostic practices what we observed in, in what I would call service settings was not matched within the family home. Some of the broader questions, I suppose, that we had was what needs to happen to address those issues of well-being and, you know, considerable in, in the previous research, the, the issues around depression and anxiety were identified. Um, not so much stress. So I, I've got a postgraduate student who is going to look at that now and see can we tease out that, that those issues there issues around what sports can be provided I'll show you some of the recommendations that we have on how do we respond to those reductions in behaviors that challenge and reductions in seizures I mean maybe that's something that we should consider that actually some for some people 
these behaviors and seizures actually reduced. Um, this was something just in our readings. How do we respond to the exclusion of people in randomized control trials for vaccines? So this was beginning to come out as we were writing up the study. And what you can see is that for most randomized control trials, one of the exclusion criteria is the capacity to consent to take part in the trial. Now that would mean that, and actually one of them actually says, excluding people with intellectual disability, they're actually named there. So there is an issue around the fact that people with ID are actually excluded from those trials. Um, and a final issue is some of those very big studies from the, the US particularly, where they have population-based data and they can really look at these trends in mortality and morbidity and impact. Um, you can only do that if you can identify people with ID in those databases. So that's a conversation I think that we need to have. And certainly that Professor Gloria Cran and the CDC in the US have been pushing for, for quite a while now. The continuation of research, these are some, can I say, spin-off uh, pieces of research. So one of my students, uh, Saivni Kunakoin and Louise Farrelly, they uh, conducted some interviews. We said that we would get the voice of the people themselves. So this was just an Irish-based study uh, with 14 adults uh, with intellectual disabilities. So this obviously is later. This is uh, when vaccines had come out. It's nearing can I say the end of, of the, um, the, the pandemic? So a few quotes here, uh, things that came out, these are kind of confidential, the paper's actually under review, but I, I hope it's okay to share these if it's with the journal. Um, so people were immensely bored. No, I didn't like it at all. It's very boring, the same things every day, watching telly, going for a walk, has been very hard on me. Um, people spoke a lot about adhering to the regulations, even a personal cost. So nobody enjoys having to wear an, a mask every time they're out, but it has to be done. I suppose it's for the greater cause. They're doing it for a reason and it's annoying. Like um, People were very, uh, very critical of, of when they observed other people not uh, adhering to rules, so selfish. They want to go on holidays and they don't care if anybody lives or dies. So there was meetings uh, around, uh, and it was on the media about people going off on holidays when they weren't supposed to. Um, and, and there was a big push on that for people with ID, um, that they really were very frustrated by people who flouted the rules. An interesting issue that came up was around the choice to vaccinate. So here's a quote, ah, I didn't want it at first. I was nervous with it in case you'd get sick with it, in case you get the virus with it. A number of the people said they were nervous like that, but every single person was vaccinated. So I think there is an issue around how we went around offering vaccines and did we offer or did we insist? There's another uh, study that we're working on now. Uh, the Irish team here, uh, Michael Tully, Eilish Rojak, uh, Aoife Farley, Catherine Jackman, Tracy Jones, and Karen Henderson, they conducted 26 uh, interviews with Irish individuals uh, with IGD, and then Helena Tauber and Jenny Aspling, Fredrickson and Magnus Tidman, they have conducted 34 interviews with individuals in Sweden. Now, the difference between these two is that in Sweden, they had very little restrictions and no lockdown. But yet we think what we see is happening is that while they may have not had that in policy, for people with ID, they kind of had it in practice. And what we're beginning to see is very similar things. So that, that's an interesting discussion around policy versus practice. Uh, so very different uh, public policies, um, but, but we think maybe the same thing is uh, happening about that to be decided. Just a sample of a few of the recommendations in the paper. You, you can uh, view the paper, it's long since published now and have a look at it. But some of the things that we were thinking for people with ID, really accurate and, and timely information in an accessible format is required. For family members, how do they respond if they observe changes in mood? People felt very helpless. So how could we do something there? For staff and management, I think we need a consultation. I think we need a discussion about avoiding closure of disability services during periods of risk. I don't know if the same thing happened again in a few months. Have we really had a discussion as to what would happen next? Um, certainly there were extra costs incurred, not only for families, but also for people with IDD where money was being taken from personal budgets by that, were, that are owned, they're the possession of people with IDD. That really needs to be covered centrally. Um, for family members need themselves information. We saw that, that the information family members got, it was 
very reduced in comparison with what staff had. Um, for staff addressing that reluctance by some support staff to reduce incidents of exploitation. Um, a final one here for people with IDD, protocols with healthcare providers about uninterrupted access. So again, I haven't shown you that data, but we did, we did come across that. Um, something needs to be done about the testing and treatment options of COVID for families because they were significantly uh, diminished when we looked at staff. Um, and then for staff, something around looking at protocols to address staff shortages during periods of risk, um, because that reliance on casual staff is, is a concern. So I think I'll call it a day there. I hope I came in on time. Thank you.